Let's invite the feared, admired, appreciated, and much adored Pearl Davis on stage. Thank you very much, Pearl. Welcome. So, it's probably best if you take a We don't need this, uh, <laughs> this chair, actually. We have a, one chair too many. Hi, guys. <laughs> Thank you all for having me. Um, this is, like, especially special because, you know, Candice, you're one of the reasons I'm conservative, actually. I grew up, like, watching you, so this is super cool. Aw, oh, thank you. <laughs> And it's even cooler because my sister's a psychology major and she's with me today. <laughs> there are good psychologists. I definitely said that, right? Um, so I'm curious, what do you guys think is the best way to fight the globalist agenda? Well, I mean, I think today is a great moment fighting it. I think coming together like this, having a great friend from America and from London, she, you're originally from America, but you live in London right now, over and, and building the alliance in this way is, is going to mean a lot. And I just saw that on the live stream, we have 2,000 additional uh, viewers today, so we're really reaching an ex a significant audience. And that's the way to go forward. We've got to spread the word, and that's happening right now. Yeah, and I would just add to that basically everything that I've said today about not being afraid to be called a name. And it's, it's very important to, to double and to triple down on the truth because the power is in their ability to, to gaslight people and to make them fearful that they won't be welcome into polite society if they don't accept the terms of the globalist agenda. And I'm, I'm very happy not to accept the terms of the globalist agenda. That's a, that's a great point. Why do you think there's a war on masculinity? Well, <laughs> one of the things that I was thinking when I was listening to your speech, Candace, and I was wondering if you were going to say something about it, is that there's another war on masculinity going on, which is the actual physical warfare that is currently happening in Ukraine which is entirely provoked by the very same power block that is undermining families through uh, transgenderism, uh, through feminism, and through all the other isms that, we've been, that you've been mentioning so brilliantly and that we've been talking about for the whole day. So, uh, generally, I feel that what is happening is that we're in the middle of a power grab by a bureaucratic superstate, which has sub-branches in different nations, but it's really a network of public and private actors, just like the World Economic Forum expresses it, as its, its stated purpose is to merge state actors as well as corporations into a single uh, bureaucratic institution that manages our lives to the, to, to the latest details. And actual wars as well as cultural wars are all part of that trend, that transition, uh, in which men won't have a place because men do defend their families, they do defend their countries, they do defend these freedoms. And, and what, what ultimately is going to stand in the way of the, of the caterpillar of the totalitarian control state is going to be strong men that will stand for their families and their values. So I, I very much believe that a society of strong men will be a free and prosperous society that will keep the, the state at bay. Yeah, and I consider this a lot because it's, it's just incredible to me. I do a lot of, of university tours, a lot of university tour stops, and to hear the questions that a lot of these should-be men 
are asking today. And when I say that, even the way they look, they look like boys, it's, it's hard to picture that just a couple of generations ago, these were the people that we were sending off to go to war. And when you physically look, you know, at the colorized images of World War II, there's, you know, documentaries on it. They look like men at 18, and now they look like boys at 18. Like when these kids come up and their hands are shaking to ask me, they hate me, but these boys are here with, you know, pink and purple hair, and they're going to ask Kenneth Owens a question. And the whole time I'm just thinking, you know, you just, you just look like such a wimp. You know, this is a word in America. In America. And, and, and what's happened, right, this, this attack, and, and there's a lot that goes into that, you know, the hormones and, and this tr very true thing that is happening, a, a drop in testosterone that is being measured from generations, and because of the food that we are eating and the hormones that, that we are consuming. But I always say don't, don't think too hard about why it's happening, right? We become so intellectual in society that we're, we're stupid. Like, it is the basic instincts, and if we just go back since the dawn of humanity, they want to conquer people, right? And it's common sense. If you want to, if, you, if you're seeing a tribe and you want to conquer that tribe, you're, you don't worry about the women and the children. You worry about the men. And so what they have been doing is conquering men via ideas and telling them that it's wrong to be a man, sufficiently weakening them slowly over time. It's the reason why I've taken so much flack for um, it being a friend of, of Andrew Tate and speaking to Andrew Tate, but what he's doing, and this doesn't say that I agree with everything he says and everything he does, but to at least see a return of people talking to men and telling them it's okay to be a man is something I haven't heard in so long that we have to applaud that, you know? Yes, yes. Do you agree, bro? What? Do you agree? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Great. It doesn't sound very sure. She's like, no, masculinity is bad. No, no, I mean, I've seen it firsthand. You know, um, especially how the legal system goes after men, you know, the Me Too era. Um, you know, they, they don't want strong men. They want men that they can control. So, I agree. Um, I'm curious how you've seen the culture change in the last 10, 15 years, and if you think we're going in a better direction. Well, I have seen it change, but I'm not sure that I see a mainstream uh, developing into a better direction. What I, when I look, when I think back of the of the the early days of my student years, about 20 years ago, uh, it started with 9/11. It was the, literally the first day of my life in college. Was was 9/11, 2001, and. Um, and, and in those 20 years, I think I've seen a, a tremendous increase in bureaucratic despotism, uh, as Tocqueville would, would call it, the, 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 the nanny state, the, the weakening of societal institutions and the increase of power of supranational institutions like the World Economic Forum, like the European Union, like uh, the World Health Organization, and so on and so forth. So I, I, I also, I'm very worried about the, the free internet. 20 years ago when I was just getting my first mobile phone and everything, the, the internet was free. You could literally write whatever you wanted, read whatever you wanted, and now more and more censorship is applied on the internet, which is a threat to the, the search for truth. So I, 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 I do think that in the past 20 years, not to speak of mass immigration, which has continued to pour into Europe as well as the United States. So I think in, in those 20 years we've declined severely and so many other things that have been brought to the, to the agenda were unthinkable 20 years ago, like CBDC, like uh, a carbon tax, an individualized CO2 tax, which they're now talking about, uh, forced vaccinations, an actual war that they're trying to provoke with Russia. Uh, all these things were unthinkable 20 years ago. They're happening now. So in that sense, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic. On the other hand, something like this was also unthinkable at that time. And of course, so many people have been building this move, uh, the, 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 the movement that I feel we're part of, the anti-globalist movement. People like you, Candace, in America, the things that you've done, Pearl, have also reached millions and millions of people. 
never underestimate what a single person with a YouTube channel can do. And, they, and that's one of the things that I wouldn't have dreamt of 20 years ago, that so many people out of their own inspiration or their own analysis would come to the same conclusions, would start doing something about it, would start building something. And I really feel that now, much more than even three years ago, because COVID really accelerated this movement, we are at this point where a parallel network is beginning to take shape. And that's, that's gen genuinely one of the most hopeful things that I'm seeing. So still I think that the vast majority of the, of the people are going in the wrong direction, but more and more people are starting to move in the other way. And I, I do feel that we're building friendships and we're no longer afraid to be called names. We no longer seek approval from our actual enemies. We're just like, up yours, we're doing our own thing. And that's great, that's just wonderful. So thank you all. I would just add there, I mean, I completely agree, and I definitely see a shift, and I'm, I'm very optimistic where I wouldn't, I wouldn't do what I do. If I, was, if I thought it was over, I would, I would at least try to live out the rest of my days in peace and not be in the fire all the time. But um, I think a big marker of that, I'm glad you brought up 9-11, because that really was something that I had to go back and examine my own childhood in terms of the propaganda, right? Different time, pre-social media, before the dawn of social media, and all of us accepted whatever narrative came through our bulky TV screens. We had the giant TV screen at my house, the, the really big ones. And I just remember that because I lived just outside of the city, so we actually had students um, in Connecticut whose fathers were killed in the towers, and I just remember every day for maybe years that we'd have to stand up, moment of silence, and I, I very much understood that I was supposed to fear Muslims. And when I say that the way Muslims were treated in America following 9-11, it makes me feel sad about it now in retrospect because I was obviously ignorant of, I didn't even know what a Muslim was. Like I actually was afraid, I remember at the airport of a Hindu guy, not knowing the difference. Like I was that young when this happened, but the programming was there, training us to, to have fear, right? As the ultimate manipulator and, and in retrospect, obviously now I was a child realizing how many of our freedoms we gave up because of fear right, the, the laws that were passed and now you can spy on Americans and things of that nature because we were fearful and reactive and we weren't actually thoughtful of what we were willing to allow, which was for the government to grow um, in a very large capacity and take over, the, uh, t you know, take over individual lives in, in many ways. And, and so that's why it's so important to, when you do fear fearful, to sort of pause and ask a question of who benefits for it. Because in America, it feels like the answer every time has been the military industrial complex. We were told that all of these rules and regulations and taking your shoes off at the airport was gonna render America safer. It hasn't. Our border is wide open. We're told that we have to fight every other person's war. And so America's definitely waking up to um, the truth which is that all of these wars are not making our country safer. So who is it actually helping? Um, all of these wars are not making us richer, right? So, so who is it actually helping? And I think a marker of that is actually quite interesting today when I woke up and obviously everybody's talking about the, the, the Russian terror attack and you would have never dreamed this post 9-11, but people are immediately asking questions uh, that they would have never asked, asking about the CIA, asking about, you know, with the understanding that we, in America and the CIA very much funded and were open about the fact in a retrospect, you know, that, that they have funded terror groups. But to see the public engage and ask that question, whether it's true or false, means that there is a level of critical thinking that is happening. Um, and even if it's, it's wrong, again, it's important that we are at least pausing and not being reactive and asking questions and seeing who is benefiting, because it's never us, it's never us. Uh, this is so important, I think. This is really, this is really the, the most important thing that is not, that's happening now and that, that I think COVID really broke the spell or the power of the conspiracy theorist um, uh, reproach. It's just, it's been proven so obviously wrong, everything the government was say, telling us. And, even, and, and they knew it was wrong. They knew they were lies. They knew that Pfizer was lying. They knew that all these things didn't work out, like lockdown didn't have effect, and so on. They knew it. They knew ivermectin was working. They knew everything. But still, they kept on with the narrative, and they kept calling us conspiracy theorists. And too many people have 
have just had enough of that. They woke up. They're like, okay, and from now on, every time the government is propagating something and calling anyone who asks questions a conspiracy theorist, I'm going to look a little bit further and deeper. I'm, I'm not going to be intimidated by that anymore. I'm, fed, I, I'm done with that. And that's, that's really a cultural change. And I, we have a great saying because we love toothpaste in the con this country. Once the toothpaste is out of the tube there, you're never going to get it back in. And that's, that's how I feel about, about it. In France, they would say the champagne is never going back into the bottle. It's just a cultural... It's <laughs> so I'm curious, you guys both have young children, right? I, I'm curious, how do you guys go about educating them so they're not indoctrinated? And how can average families do that themselves? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting because I'm convinced my toddler is more educated than most leftists in my country. Like, it's like he understands... <laughs> Like, mommy, that's a, I'm a boy, and he understands his sister is a girl. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we have a genius. We have a genius. <laughs> but, you know, I think it, what's really happened also is it, this concept of sort of letting the inmates run the asylum. And, and what I'm talking about is this soft parenting, like this new psychological thing that has come in where now parents are giving credence to every single thing that their child says. Mommy, I wanna, you know, I, I'm, I wanna be a mermaid. And now they're like, my child identifies as a mermaid <laughs> and you know, I'm gonna leave them in the bath. And, and that has been a plague on our society. You know, really uh, rotten kids become rotten adults, right? And so I think the first thing that me and my husband have always agreed on is that we, we very much believe that children need rules and they need regulations and they need structure. And it, there is something about Marxism that of course the first element is to constantly destabilize. You constantly want to destabilize and you're seeing that happen at the molecular level now and, and parents think that they're, they're loving their children by giving them no discipline. And that's, it, that's the exact opposite. They, they need to learn discipline and structure uh, because you know, the world demands that if you want to actually be successful. Uh, for us, uh, the, 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 the famous Article 23 of the Dutch Constitution became extremely important when we had our son. Uh, Article 23 of the Dutch Constitution enables organizations, churches, and other uh, societal institutions to set up their own schools according to their own beliefs. And that's, that's been a very strong tradition in the Netherlands uh, where we have had uh, not merely state education, as for example in France, all schools there are state controlled, but uh, a lot of uh, uh, Christian schools obviously, but also uh, of other denominations. And with our party, we have following the, the liberties granted under Article 23 of our Constitution, set up our own school, our own elementary school, which is in Almere, which is in the center of the country. And there we try to give the example of, of, of setting up a school along the ideals that we believe in, with, um, without all the woke indoctrination, the transgenderism, no vegetarian weeks, no um, uh, apologizing for our past, but, but, but they're, they're told proper history lessons and all these things. And, and so for us, the fact that we have a private school system that is still funded by the state, but is run by parents on a small scale, is one of the great, greatest and most important liberties that we have and one of the sources of hope that I feel from, for our country because parents, I think, are much more able to decide on the curriculum than bureaucrats in large skyscrapers back in The Hague or Brussels. So that's, that's a great, uh, great option and great possibility we still have. So it's interesting because we're all from different areas. Um, I live in the UK, you live in the US, you live here. Um, I'm curious, how has immigration affected where you live? Okay, so immigration, uh, immigration, I think, uh, when we define the term, we mean un the complete uncontrolled, unskilled immigration uh, of 
hundreds of thousands of people from completely different cultural, religious, ethnic, historical backgrounds from, from Europe, or from the Netherlands, into our country. Uh, they, um, the, uh, the, the discussion about immigration has been severely tainted by, uh, again, by all these swear words and all these terms, the labels that they're trying to put on us. But the, the, essential, the essential effect of immigration is, is threefold in, the, in my country. The first is that we have severe cultural and social tensions across the board. When you, when you, when you really look at um, the uh, educational system or the way in which women are treated on the street or simply having a drink at night with your friends, it's, it's in, in so many cities and places, it's not a it's not an easy thing, it's not a, not a self-evidency anymore that you can have that kind of social life because of the tensions on the street. Uh, it, it's really, it's a, there's a, over the whole line, there's a cultural clash going on in all of our countries in Europe, and that is significantly deforming our lives. And, it's the, the, and the, the paradoxical thing about it, or the sad thing, is that precisely the people that you see so often on television or in politics, I'm the exception, but they have the abilities to exempt themselves from the consequences of it because they have, uh, relatively speaking, high incomes, they have a certain social network, they can escape from the consequence of it, but the vast majority of the lower and middle classes are living with that constant conflict in the street, this silent, unspoken civil war that's going on in our cities. And that's, that's just absolutely terrible and unforgivable that these people have done that to us. The second thing is that it has completely destroyed the welfare state because there's an extreme over-dependence of immigrants from Africa and the Middle East on the social system. And I'm talking about healthcare, I'm talking about educational uh, uh, backlash, I'm talking about uh, social housing, it's just the whole system is, is uh, being, is, is almost going down uh, and, and under and, and not functioning anymore because of the vast over-representation, also in crime, I mean, there's an incredible over-representation of people of immigrant background in crime, which obviously costs society an incredible amount. And third, the mass immigration is the direct cause for a massive, massive crisis in living spaces. It's virtually impossible now for people of the next generation to buy a house. It's just impossible, it, unless you're very, either very rich or you're living very much out, out, of, the, out of the center of the country, you know, where, where it's very uh, not densely inhabited. But in principle, because of all the influx of people, uh, we've, we, we ran out, we're running out of houses. So, and these three things have seriously, fundamentally, structurally deformed our lives. And the only thing that I see we can do is put a stop on mass immigration, first thing. And second thing, which is also something that we've been arguing for, uh, promote re-migration programs. Help people that are unhappy here, that are obviously not fitting into our societies, to, re to start a business elsewhere, to, to, to relocate to their nations of origin, and, uh, and, and that's the only way that I see to get out of this mess that we're in. I was actually interested in hearing your answer on that because the immigration issue looks like a, it's a different picture depending on what country you are, which is what you were saying. But I just wanted to ask you a question about that. Is your immigration problem legal or illegal immigrants? Uh, like, do it, you guys have an illegal immigration flux, influx as well? No, no, no okay. it's legal. It's okay. legal. And, and to me, it doesn't matter if it's legal or illegal. The problem to me is immigration, not right, legal yeah. or illegal. Yeah, but I was just, I was asking that question only because obviously America, first thing I'll say is it's an, it's an invasion where you're being invaded. And that's the difference is that nobody is okay with this. And yet it's, it's systematic. They're receiving packets from the UN on how to invade the US border um, while our Department of Justice looks away, while they pretend that they don't know what's happening. I mean, since Biden got into office, 10 million illegal immigrants have come over the, the American border. 
So you can imagine the frustration, just, just to paint that picture to you. And they're not coming from Mexico. So that, that myth of like, you know, these are just Mexicans that are struggling for an opportunity. Nope, nope, nope. You know, the news is showing us the people are coming from Kazakhstan, from China. It's, it's utterly insane. And it's obviously formal, it's intentional. And there are, are globalist um, NGOs that are behind it that are behind doing this under the guise of saying, well, these are refugees, they're not, they're well-dressed even. It, I mean, I was, I was covering this on, on my podcast. Of, they, they look like they're going on a hike. They know exactly what to do. There's a drop-off point. Um, they're told, step two, drop your IDs here. So there's a point at the border where you can just collect all of these IDs, you know? Um, so it's an organized invasion of our border. So you can imagine the American frustration when not only are the taxpayers going to have to deal with that because the idea is to get them in, to give them all the benefits that you just spoke about, to hand them free money, but also at the same time we're being told that we're selfish if we care about that because Ukraine's borders need to be <laughs> defended, because Israel's borders need to be defended, right? I don't want to defend anybody's borders until we put a stop to what is happening on the American border. So what I will say about immigration, and you are correct that whether it's legal or illegal, this is the point you are making, is that the long-term threat of that, and this is why you know that it is globalists that are doing this to our countries, making nationalism a dirty word, making a national identity something that is perceived as backwards and racist and wrong, is because ultimately what they understand is that multiculturalism doesn't really work. Of course it doesn't work. What is your culture? <laughs> What, what is your culture? What, what can I experience when I come here that I can't experience in America? And they, they do this because they know that eventually when you just say everybody's culture can come here and they're gonna sing Kumbaya, that's not gonna be the circumstance. If there's going to be friction, there are going to be you know, battles, a battle of ideas, and countries that are having these internal conflictions are not countries that can survive. So that is the problem with unfettered legal and illegal immigration in any country. You know, I'm curious, Candace, because I've been watching you for a couple of years, and you went especially viral during um, the whole Black Lives Matter protests. I'm curious, when did you realize that it was a scam? Right off the bat. <laughs> the day George Floyd died, I knew it was a scam. I did. And I will tell you why, because I, I just, I really comprehend the media, and when the media just seizes on something that quickly and that globally, it had all the flags of, we're not being told the full story, and this is an incentive of some description. Also, anything that happens in an election year, you know, I'm just way more conscious in an election year of any, any uh, social movement that takes off, but at its root, Black Lives Matter to me was very clearly a fraud because it was encouraging black Americans to perceive themselves as victims. And any group that is being encouraged to perceive themselves as victims, that's only happening because they, they want you to perceive someone else as the oppressor, right? And what happens when you have this complex of victim and oppressor, and by the way, this is writ large, you can say, you know, women versus men, that's feminism, right? The victim versus the oppressor, rich versus the poor, black versus white in our country, is that ultimately it's just, it's meant to cause division. And the problem, however, is that people can't perceive that right away. And unfortunately, I warned everyone, do not donate, do not donate to BLM, it is very clearly, um, some, some sort of a shell company, you're not gonna know where that money is going, but I can guarantee you, it is not going to go into black neighborhoods. And I think they, they raised 90 million in less than a year, and that money went to trans organizations. I mean, a, a, really, I did an entire accounting of where that money went. And what happened was the founders bought themselves lavish mansions, big lavish mansions, and then the rest of the money went to culturally Marxist causes, number one among them being transgenderism. And so it's really important for people when you think that you're helping, again, if you are having a feeling and the news is telling you that this feeling is valid, to just pause and reflect and, and to ask what's actually happening. And, and BLM, just from the very beginning, seemed to me like a, a government. I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious. <laughs> You took so much heat. You took like a crazy amount of heat a couple of years ago. Did any of your critics and detractors come back and say, Candace, you were right? They did. This makes me so happy. Really? First and foremost, because I always make sure they do. I'll do a video like, hi, it's me. <laughs> 
Remember the girl that you were saying was an Uncle Tom and a race trader? Just checking in, ladies and gentlemen. But they did. I, I, I did a video and I was, you know, being tongue in cheek and they did. They apologized and said they were wrong and they were outraged by the fact that the BLM founder, which, by the way, were a bunch of it, it was a lesbian woman who was married to a trans something or another. You know, the entire thing was just a Marxist operation and it was very clear. And they did actually apologize for the way that they treated me. So that was actually kind of nice. <laughs> I'm shocked. I, I do feel, though, I do feel for the police officer that was incarcerated for supposedly murdering George Floyd. I really, I genuinely feel for him, and I think we should, you know, try to yeah. Derek do Chauvin. something for him. Derek Chauvin is, a, he's a victim, and I showed this in my documentary. The news was showing everybody that one image of him, and they showed only, they never released throughout all of this, they would not release the full, arresting, the full arrest tape, and there was a reason for that. And that was immediately suspicious, because in America, if a conservative gets arrested, if I get arrested right now, that arrest tape will be on the internet in four minutes, okay? And they would not release it. All you had was one woman who had filmed it, Darnella Frazier, and you hear him saying, I can't breathe. And then they just fought tooth and nail to never allow um, the full arrest to be released to the public. And when you see the full tape, if you haven't, you should go pursue it. What it shows you is very clearly, um, he was from the very beginning being resistant. You know, they responded to a call. Multiple officers kept asking him to come out of the car. I, I think what happened, just based on what I can see, is he just ingested the drugs that were in his car. Obviously, sadly, we were dealing with somebody who was an addict. He was a fentanyl, uh, a fentanyl addict, an opioid addict, rather, and he ingested the drugs. Then he instantly starts saying, oh, they tried to put him in the car <laughs> several times. They had him in the car. He starts saying he's claustrophobic. He doesn't want to be in the car. And then the most critical part of this is they're like, please, you know, just stay in the police cruiser. You just came out of a car. They're like, why are you acting so funny? And why? And they're asking his drug dealer who was with him, why is he acting so funny? Why is he listening to our orders? Then George Floyd explicitly asks the police officers to put him on the ground. He was saying, I can't breathe from the second they arrived on the scene. This is a very long tape. He's saying, I can't breathe, man. I can't breathe. Then he's like, I don't want to sit in the car. I, he gets out. They were incredibly patient. He asks to be put on the ground. They put him on the ground, and what you can't see from the angle is that police are actually taught when you put them in that ground position to put your knee onto uh, the, the top of the back. So from the front angle, this would look like this is my neck, but actually it was, it was a police position that they were trained to do. You know, you can be critical of Derek Chauvin, and, and you, should, you could say, you could watch the whole tape, and you could say, well, couldn't they see he was having an overdose of some description? It's, it's, it's your guess whether or not he's just trying to get out of an arrest and making up a bunch of stuff because he's going on for such a long period of time, whether he's just saying stuff and by the end they're like, okay, buddy, we've had enough of this, we're just going to arrest you. But the idea that they set out to murder a black man, uh, it's, it is such a nonsense and Derek Chauvin is literally in solitary confinement, his entire life taken from him, someone that had never been in trouble and was taking care of his mother. It's a horrific crime. The justice system did not serve justice in that case and it's, it's, it's very sad. So, hopefully, if Trump gets re-elected, he will issue a presidential pardon for Darren, Derek Chauvin should Derek get Chauvin, part. but also for Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, and the January Sixers, Ross Ulbricht, and the January Sixth people. We need to, we really need to push for a pardon for all these Edward people. Edward Snowden, did you say? Yes. Snowden, absolutely. yes. Okay, great. And himself. And himself. <laughs> great Indeed. answer. You know, speaking of the election, Candace, would you ever consider running? You know, I get this question all the time. I am running behind toddlers at the moment, um, and I love what I do. I think that people are, you know, vice president, the greatest impact I can have is to be able to impact culture from a tweet, you know, to be able to do a podcast to talk about these topics, to bring people to new ideas. And honestly, I personally think that people that want to be in office, I think you should be thinking of it as much more sacrificial. It would be such a sacrifice for me to go to office and to uproot my entire life to just be attacked every single day um, from the mainstream media. I, I love my life and I love that I'm able to impact culture in a way that makes sense for me and my family. I'm not saying never, I'm saying definitively not right now.
And you need to be a trans to be in office, so. Yeah, that's exactly right, that's right. I don't meet the requirements, I guess. So recently um, in the UK, I play volleyball there. And there recently was an all men's team at one of our tournaments. What, what is the best way to, I guess, change these institutions from the inside? Wait, do you mean men were competing against women? women. So yeah. They were trans? trans. Oh, yeah. That's, okay. It was okay. like an all, all trans I was like, team. men can play I'm volleyball. Men. I think that's okay. Okay, got <laughs> it. So they're trans men competing against women. Because it's uh, like when you're in it, it's like, what I'm are you... So, I'm just so embarrassed for those men. It's, Can I just say that just from like a fundamental level? The idea of men dressing up as women so that they can win yeah. is just, it's so, so pathetic. No, Candace, Candace. Like they're, they're, they're the biggest losers in society. I want to say that. The biggest only, losers. the only sports is perhaps where this is, would be allowed is perhaps chess. But th that's it. Yeah, I, yeah, it's. That's the thing, it's just so embarrassing that it's come to this. They're the most unathletic guys, like always, 100% of the time. That's the point, that's the point. Yeah. They never could win against other men, so they're like, you know what, actually I'm a woman, and then they dominate in female sports, so they are the greatest cowards of our time, are the men that transition to compete against women and win. I guess my question is, how do you how do you change these institutions from the inside? Yeah, you know, it's it's a lot of work, and I think a lot of the uh, it goes back to what we were saying about political correctness because I see so many of these parents that reach out to me and they'll tell me what's going on in their school or they'll talk about a situation like that and they're like, what can we do? What can we do? Well, don't don't email me. You 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 need to raise hell, you know, because I'll tell you what these institutions don't like. They don't like attention. They don't like when people start pointing out what they're doing. They don't like when people say, actually, what's happening to my child is not okay, and I, I plan on taking this to court, I'm not going to stop. You know, the, the fighter instinct in parents has been so removed because of this idea that you want to be socially accepted. I am so okay with not being accepted, not hanging out in the mommy clubs, if it means that I have to pretend that I'm okay with my child being told that they can pick their gender. Like, I am, my children are not yet in school, uh, they're too young, but I am so, I feel bad for the schools that they go, because I am going to be like a hawk. I will go, I'll, I'll be like, we're going every day to talk to the principal, what do you wanna to wear today? I'll be matching with my kids to go to school before I allow people to, to do these sorts of things. So the institutions have only gotten stronger because we have allowed them to become stronger. We need to, to, to shame them in every single capacity. I mean, the concept of the reason why trans men are, are, what do you call them, trans women? When you transition to a man, when you transition to a woman, you're a trans woman, is that correct? Are spiking the ball on women is because women are too polite, right? Look at what men did when Budweiser, one little commercial, like when they invaded into a male space and Dylan Mulvaney was like, ha ha, I'm a girl. Men were like, heck no. And, and they completely drowned Bud Light and, and turned the company into a corporate joke. Women need to have this same response and we, and we need to, to shame men that are behaving like this, calling them sissies, calling them names and not allowing them to invade into our spaces. Just to add, to add to this, because I think it's very important that we do push back indeed and we, we don't allow it to happen and, and what happened to to Bud Light is, is a great example that we were talking about earlier, of course, this afternoon as well. And that brings me to the point that I wanted to raise, how we can change institutions or how we can effectively push back, which is to organize ourselves on a social and economic level. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's not enough to win the battle of ideas. We also, we, because ideas, there was, never the, there was never a majority for mass immigration. Nobody actually convinced anyone that we needed to have transgenderism in schools. It just, it, oh, it happened. How did it happen? Because the big lobbies and the big corporations and the, and the, and the, and the entire social economic structure of our society was penetrated, was infiltrated by people that were ideologues. They were very serious about this and that's why BlackRock demands that any company that they invest in uh, supports the sustainable development goals and so on and so forth. So, and diversity uh, goals and inclusivity and so on. 
So what we need to do is to strengthen our network, which is not just going to be a network of friends and of people that will, that will talk about ideas on stages like this, but I want you all to think about what you're going to do with your wallet, with your purse. How are you going to spend your euros or dollars? And I, I made the example a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the farmers' protests, and I was criticizing people that are out on the street the whole day supporting the farmers. No farmers, no food. That's great, right? We all support that. But then at the end of the day, they're tired, they drive back home, stop by a big supermarket, and just get a little bit of food from the, from the great food chains to make some food for their kids or their family or whatever. Not realizing that by spending those euros or dollars on the big food corporations and the big other corporations that present their stuff in supermarkets, they were, they were annulling, they were canceling the very protest that they had been doing the whole day because they were supporting the big corporations that are pushing out our farmers. So we need to realize that with every euro we spend, we can either support movements like ours or we can undermine them by supporting Megacorp, the big super giant corporations that are out there to take control over mm. us. So in addition to everything that has been said here, which I agree to wholeheartedly, I just wanted to add the social economic level, guys. That's what we've been building with our forum app and that's what's going to change the world in the long run. Mm. And I'll quickly add to that because that's very true. It, it seems like such a big thing, a big ask. What can we do to change because the institution seems so large? Well, it is about what you can do on an individual level. Like the world had a mask policy, not in my house. And we had a person that came over that was going to help with our children. And she walked in with a mask. And I said, oh, you actually don't have to wear that here. And she said, I prefer to. We let her right back out of the house, you know? You're not gonna be looking at my child like a super villain, right? So we never, there was no mask policy. We didn't do anything. I would have never allowed my children to travel and have to put on a mask. The, the, the concept of that is, is quite frightening for a small child not, not to be able to see faces and to recognize that faces are friendly. And we shop at the farmer's market every weekend. These are, these are little things that we do on an individual household, but that's how you should consider yourself. Consider yourself small. What can I do on an individual level? Even carrying cash. Right? COVID bringing in this cashless society is giving them more control to see your moves. Carry cash, be a rebel. Carry cash, start a family, kick out people that wear masks out of your own household. And drive gasoline cars, guys. Yeah. No electric cars, no way. Yes. Um, okay, one last question. Um, Candice, you've had a lot of changes in the past 48 hours. What does the future hold for you? You know, I, I love change, I really do. And I, I've always embraced it, and um, at every point in my career, I've known when it's time to, to go to the next level and there's something bigger um, that's, that, I'm, that I'm after, uh, a bigger concept that I'm after, or something that I'm understanding. And you know, I very much understand right now that we are in the midst of an awakening. Uh, all around the world, people are understanding that things are, are backwards and things are wrong, and there's something about it. We talked about this the other day that feels very spiritual. You know, I am a Christian, and it, for me, even that, Christianity being somehow treated like it's dirty, there's this rise of this term, Christian nationalism in America, people that are basically trying to pervert uh, faith, family, all of these things are attacking this, this crucial, crucial pillar of faith. And, you know, I uh, plan on just making everything that I have done even bigger and giving myself more independence and more freedom to talk about the, the topics that I believe are crucial if we are, are going to, to save ourselves and, and to save this world from these evil, maniacal, psychopathic globalists that want to monitor every piece of our lives. So, tons of stuff coming up. I'm excited. And I'm grateful that so many people around the world have, have just supported me on my journey because at the end of the day, my loyalty will always be to truth. Well, we all support you very much, Candice, and thank you so much for, so for having much. been here with us today. Candice Owens and, of course, Pearl Davis, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for this conversation. And, I mean, just, yeah, just take the applause.
Take all of it in. It's all for you.